Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. In a moment, we'll get started with our ServiceNow and Puppet integrations breakout, or as we call it, Better Together. Um, I'm Joseph Singer. I'm a principal systems engineer with Puppet out of the Northeast. And let's get started. If you're joining this uh, Puppetize event, presumably you already know something about Puppet. But on the off chance, uh, you need a little bit of an intro, and especially with respect to how these integrations work together, I think it's valuable to just ground us with a little bit about the Puppet Enterprise platform. In this case, the area I want to focus on is the content that we see on the left-hand side. And this represents the Puppet Forge, the community content, as well as the certified content that's available. And of course, all the custom content that people build. And this content can consist of task-based or sort of scripted models, which if you've attended any of the Bolt sessions today, you've seen some of that behavior, uh, as well as the model-based traditional Puppet uh, approach. And we're going to touch on a little bit of both of those as part of a demonstration today. The Puppet Enterprise platform is uh, significantly able to integrate with a lot of the tools that you already have in your environment. So using the API, both inbound and outbound, we're able to leverage a lot of the enterprise level solutions that most of our customers have. And as you can see, and of course, in line with today's session, ServiceNow being the primary one that we're going to look at for today. The kind of people that use Puppet, of course, span lots of different lines of business, but typically we'll see platform and infrastructure teams looking at Puppet from a configuration management point of view, and of course, doing things like compliance as well. I also mentioned impact analysis. That's going to be very important when we get into the change management uh, part of our demonstration. We also see teams looking at things like self-service automation around um, provisioning and request management, as well as remediation and patch capabilities. So there's lots of areas that Puppet can touch on. We're actually going to touch on a few of those today as part of our demonstration. And the value of Puppet Enterprise, of course, is to make things quick in the sense that I can make requests and have users drive requests, fulfill those requests very quickly, do it efficiently where I can reuse a lot of the content and provide um, reliable and predictable behaviors. And that leads into reducing the amount of security issues or the amount of compliance problems that we have when we run these configurations. So in a similar fashion, let's take a look at ServiceNow. And here again, if you're joining this session, presumably you know a lot about ServiceNow, probably more than I do. Uh, but if we look at ServiceNow from a overall perspective, uh, it's the acknowledged leader in ITSM and IT operations management. And it provides lots of different kinds of workflows for lots of different use cases, and customers choose which modules or which workflows they're interested in. From our point of view, it's obviously the IT focus, IT workflow focus. And if we look at how this platform grew and became to be so successful, it's because it replaced the old world of siloed tools. Back when I started in the industry, there was a tool for managing delivery. There was a tool for managing operations. Um, probably spreadsheets and emails were floating around as well. And there tended to be a lot of disconnect between these teams and a lot of uh, stress to get things accomplished. From the point of view of where it evolved to, ServiceNow now has a centralized platform for sharing the data model among 
all the modules that they provide. So if I'm doing change management, I'm doing incident management, I'm doing uh, event handling and self-service requests, those are all leveraging the same centralized storage of content and information. And that's around the CMDB, the Configuration Management Database. So those are um, kind of an intro perspective. Let's talk about what we're gonna focus on from a uh, integration point of view. So I mentioned the CMDB, the Configuration Management Database, and that's where ServiceNow stores the configuration elements, the CIs that it operates on. Many customers also will use uh, request management or service catalog capabilities to have users make requests. And then a series of ITIL type behaviors are represented in ServiceNow. Things like change management for uh, approving changes that are expected. Things like incident management for situations where something happens that's unexpected that needs to be reported on. And problem management to track ongoing problems. Our two products, ServiceNow and Puppet, are actually often used in parallel. So if we consider the fact that we're two sides of, of the coin, in a sense, ServiceNow is managing the processes around these changes, whereas Puppet is actually implementing these changes. And lots of people have built integrations on their own, uh, typically with a, a lot of heavy lifting and in, in an unsupported way. So this was really a very common request and a very significant request that we kept getting around, can these products be integrated? And the good news is we're here today to talk about the fact that yes, they can, and there are supported integrations between them to really leverage the fact that Puppet knows a lot about the devices that it's managing. Service know, knows all about the processes around what's required to manage those devices. So as of right now, there are four primary areas of integration with ServiceNow from a Puppet point of view. The first three are things I'm gonna talk about in some detail and actually show today. The last one is a roadmap item. We're working through some of the details in terms of how we actually wanna implement that. So let's start with the first one, self-service infrastructure. Self-service inf infrastructure is a way for us to allow users to control the systems that they manage and they're responsible for without actually requiring them to know anything about Puppet. So they're able to leverage a piece of the self-service infrastructure and have that link to Puppet without giving them the full access. So why would I want that? Well, it's probably unrealistic to teach everybody in an organization how to use Puppet and more so, it may not even be desirable from an access point of view. I'd really like to have a subject matter a team that knows how to do Puppet and distributes content, and then end users that literally don't need to know anything other than I need to make a request to do something. And this is really a much better way for a large organization uh, of disparate kind of users to interact with Puppet. So that's the why. Let's look at the what. The what is a mechanism for uh, end users to interact with, say, a server, as you can see in the example on the right side, and provide some data in ServiceNow about that server, which gets sent to Puppet and has Puppet take uh, action on that data. So directly within the ServiceNow interface, I can invoke automation on the Puppet side, for example, to define what type of server this is, to define any uh, packages or things that should be installed or uninstalled. And the beauty of this is I get to leverage my existing ServiceNow set of workflows and however I customize those things to accomplish what I need to, while at the same time letting Puppet do the part that it excels at, which is actually implementing these changes. And now let's talk about the how. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, what we're looking at is details within the Puppet representation for a given server. Uh, 
And these are what we call facts. They're represented as uh, name value pair. So for example, the fact uh, domain is puppet.com. The authenticated fact is remote. The big innovation for this particular in integration is something that we call the external trusted fact. So you'll notice there it says external and then service now below that. This information is what we were able to pull back from ServiceNow, and specifically the things that I highlight there are the things that we set in the ServiceNow form. So things like which environment uh, for Puppet is appropriate, which packages should be enforced. So we, we actually read a ServiceNow table using an API, we pull back the information that we care about, and we populate it into the Puppet facts for that node, and at that point, Puppet's behavior is such that it can query those things and say, well, what did the user put in ServiceNow? What do they want this to look like, for example? And here's a user quote. So uh, a cloud engineer at a major bank, uh, someone who actually spoke at Puppetize in an earlier session for the EMEA folks, said that really adding packages within ServiceNow is a game changer because right now that's something that requires a lot of handling on the part of administrators, whereas if I get to do it this way, it's something that uh, end users can do on their own while still maintaining control because they can't do whatever they want. They can do whatever we expose in that form. And having all that CMDB data directly available to Puppet as facts is very useful because there are lots of details that ServiceNow knows about these systems that we do not track in Puppet. And that's certainly information that's useful for us. Before I show you how this works, just sort of a visual uh, flow diagram. So if we start with the process of Puppet Enterprise on the left-hand side, at the time that the Puppet run should occur, either on a scheduled basis or when triggered, it will retrieve the state from ServiceNow. So it'll reach into that table uh, and pull back, for example, the enforce package list. And then it will pass that to the nodes srv1.company.com and we'll say these are things that need to be enforced on that node. So it's very transparent to both sides. And that's a key point. Whatever workflow you define in ServiceNow, that still takes effect. However the code is written on Puppet, that doesn't change. All that changes is now we have an additional set of properties that are passed between the systems. And there's another uh, interesting aspect to this integration. If you're familiar with how Puppet uh, defines content for nodes, there's a process called a node classifier or a concept, I should say, called a node classifier. And what that means is I classify a node or a given group of nodes, for example, to be a database server or a web server. And from that point onwards, Puppet knows all the details about how that should occur, including if it needs, uh, say, a web server, it, it will need the actual binaries, it will also need a web server configuration and it may need a set of firewall rules and port definitions and home pages and all the content that goes along with that. That's all abstracted away. I just need to say, this is now a web server. In this example, I said it's a DB server, similar fashion. There'll be a database binary, uh, there'll be a configuration file and maybe user settings and grants and roles and all the database stuff. All that is embedded in the Puppet content and just abstracted out at this level. So very simply, as a user, I could say, here's my system, make it a database server and now make it a web server. I can even make these checkboxes or whatever you wanna do in the ServiceNow side. And with that, let's take a look at what this actually looks like in a live system. So the first thing we're gonna be looking at is what it means for us to provide this self-service infrastructure from ServiceNow. So this uh, is very similar to what you've seen a moment ago in the sense that um, it's a form within ServiceNow. 
In this case, it's a form uh, that is accessing the CMDB and updating that information. Um, and I'm specifying here, I want this to have a role of sample website. I can pass details, for example, parameters for that website, maybe port definition, um, homepage, whatever is necessary. And also I'm saying uh, I want to enforce this package called nano. And earlier I did this and I said absent, I'm going to say present. So what that means to Puppet is check that this package exists. If it doesn't, install it. If it's corrupt or misconfigured, fix it. You know, just straight Puppet terminology says whatever it takes to get nano on that system, do it with that one word. And that, that's kind of really essentially the model for what I do in the ServiceNow side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually update this form. It will pass that information as we have just seen to Puppet and Puppet will take some action on our behalf. So let's update this. And we'll take a look at Puppet. So this is that system. As I mentioned, there's a set of facts. We're going to look at that in a moment. And why don't we look at something right now, which is, let me look for the word trusted. So you'll notice here, I have external trusted facts for ServiceNow. Essentially, the, the entire CMDB record. Most of it's not populated in this case, but that's okay. What I'm interested in is looking at the things that we looked at. So you'll notice here, nano, it's set to absent because that was the previous value. As soon as we tell Puppet to run, it's going to query it and we'll actually update this value. And similar things like the Puppet classes, role, sample, website. So let's go ahead and run Puppet on this node. And here again, uh, from an introductory point of view, I can run Puppet on all my nodes, on an individual node. In this case, I'm just going to run it on this individual node. We'll give this, it just takes a few seconds. And what we're going to expect to see is at least one change, presumably the one change I expect, which is that that nano uh, package was previously absent and now it should exist. And I, that all happened from the ServiceNow side. And this could be really anything. It could be the profile for the server. It could be a set of user settings, whatever is necessary. So I can see here I have one intentional change on this system. And that one intentional change, as we expect, is it was purged and now it's present. And if I wanted to, I could log into that system and actually see uh, that it exists. Um, I can also look at the facts again. So if we look at the trusted facts again, well, we should see that nano package is now present. So that's the the end-to-end the -end self service piece. Once again, we showed going to the form in ServiceNow and actually making a change. These forms and workflows are up to you completely. So we just did a very simple form point of view. Um, you could have these things do some validation. For example, is this user allowed to install a website? Is this uh, particular machine qualified to have a website running on it? Is it in the right domain? Whatever is necessary. And one other comment I'll make is right now we're just editing the CMDB table, which in many uh, of our customers we were told is not the way they like to behave. They prefer to do it in such a way where they have a true self-service uh, user entry point, and then a set of uh, bundled individual elements that they could attach to say, for example, install a website or run some service or start or stop, reboot a system, 
rather than executing something directly against the CMDB record. So that's also something that we're working on in the uh, ServiceNow integration hub. We expect to have spokes, as they're called, to address that, that kind of behavior that's desired. So now let's look at the second integration. The second one was change management. And for this one, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to uh, change the way that uh, the process works today, where typically there's change requests that are manually entered. There are change review boards that look at changes that are proposed and really make a decision based on an educated guess. We're trying to find a better way to do that and leveraging Puppet as well as uh, a, an add-on to Puppet to do some of that behavior for us. So why do this? Well, Puppet as the change execution engine and ServiceNow as the workflow around that change engine is a, various, a very obvious way to implement DevOps. And more importantly, as I mentioned, reducing the manual effort and ensuring that the change impact is realistic rather than a guess is a tremendous value. So that's the why. Let's look at the what. The what is to generate ServiceNow requests automatically from Puppet and do this in such a way that it represents uh, a proposed code change. So if I'm a Puppet subject matter expert and I make a change to Puppet code that affects a system, I want to be able to commit that code to my repository and have all this process happen transparently behind the scenes. So as soon as I commit a code change, we will create this change ticket, pass all the information in, and then assuming it goes through the workflow to approve this change, which is again, our customer's workflow in ServiceNow, we'll pick it up again and make that change and deploy that change out to the appropriate environments. And now the how. So this particular integration relies on a, uh, an add-on to Puppet called CD for PE, or more fully, continuous delivery for Puppet Enterprise. And that's a process that allows us to build pipelines. And you see an example on the, on the right side of the screen, uh, pipelines that really automate the process of deploying Puppet code. So not the thing that runs the Puppet code, but further upstream, the thing that takes uh, the Puppet code, puts it in the right location to be run and runs automated tests against it, et cetera. So we're going to use that piece, and we're also going to interact with ServiceNow through its API to actually create the change request and feed the data in from, uh, from what we know about these systems. And we also create a, a business role in ServiceNow to pick it up at the end and invoke CD for PE to say, yes, it's now ready to go. And that's represented in that deploy to production step on the right side bottom. And here's a quote from, um, from a major health insurance provider in the US. Using impact analysis to, to do risk the change approvals completely changes the way they work. And the reason for that is um, I've been in, in CAB meetings. I'm sure we all have. In many cases, it's an educated guess. The change is proposed. People say, well, it should only affect this number of systems. We've, we've tested it on a group of systems. We think that's the only impact. It's a small change or it's a large change. Someone reviews it and then someone basically says, you know what? We'll go ahead with it and here's our, here's our back out plan in case things go off the rails. But imagine that you could actually know the impact before you even do it. In the sense, is it going to impact multiple applications? Is, it, is that one line change going to ripple through several things? For example, a firewall change could knock out lots of things. Is it going to affect one system, 10 systems, or my entire production environment? I don't know without something like uh, an integration like this. And the model is, as we're about to see, will 
do the actual implementation of the change through CD for PE and Puppet, and ServiceNow will do the existing workflow process for change management. And here again is a flow diagram. So we start on the bottom left. Some administrator or author or subject matter expert proposes a Puppet code change. For example, I want to change a port on the web server because we've noticed some, uh, some behavior we want to stop. So I make the change to the code, and then I actually commit that code in Git. That will trigger CD for PE on the left-hand side, which will in turn create the change request on ServiceNow and pass information in from impact analysis. And that's a, a term that I only mentioned once before here, but it's a part of CD for PE that's able to analyze the changes before anything actually gets deployed. And I'm going to show you an example of that pretty soon. And then we're living in the ServiceNow side. We're in the whole workflow process. People have, you know, pager duty and a number of other tools that handle escalations and approvals and who's allowed to do it for which systems, what the risk levels are, whatever the workflow that people know and love in ServiceNow, when that finally gets approved, ServiceNow will then call back into CD for PE and inform it to deploy the change and then the entire process is complete. So let's take a look at a demo of this one. So I'm going to get myself ready here. Uh, you'll notice in the change requests area, see if I can make this slightly bigger. I've got um, an empty queue, so no change requests currently. And let's take a look at the kind of change that we can propose. So in this case, I'm going to make a change to my Linux server configuration for that sample website. So remember, that was the profile that I uh, associated with this, the role for that. And it's currently hard-coded to port 80 as a default, Let's say we need to change that to port 8080 as an example. So I'm going to come in. Typically, there would be some workflow for developers with an editor and not doing it directly in Git. But for simplicity, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to say uh, updated the port to 8080. And we'll go ahead and commit that change. So in that continuous delivery for Puppet Enterprise element, you'll notice that there is a new events button. And that represents the trigger for that code change. And as you can see, there's the comment, there's the version of the code change that I'm proposing that I committed, but did not yet deploy to production. And in this case, we're going to be executing what we call a pipeline. The pipeline you can see on the right-hand side. It's a, designed to be a very simple way to define the steps that need to happen before something gets deployed. So the first set of uh, elements are some automated tests, and that's our code validation stage. We'll check syntax. We'll check uh, correct usage and style, because on, ultimately, if the syntax fails, what's the point of going any further? It's just going to fail down the line. And then we're going to do, in this case, in our pipeline, a deployment to a development environment where we'll do some testing. And of course, we can kind of see where things are as we go. So the pipeline on the right side is going top to bottom in terms of how it executes. What you're seeing on the left side is newest things on top. So you can see, for example, we did these jobs. Uh, we're doing this deployment now. And now we're actually running this impact analysis. And that's represented in this stage. And when that's done, we're going to look at this ServiceNow change request stage, which is the magical part we're here to talk about. Um, and then ultimately, when that gets approved, notice it's not set to automatically promote, we'll actually do the deployment to production. So we're sitting in this impact analysis stage. And let me give you an idea of what that looks like. Just for the sake of time, we can start looking at it uh, before it completes. So this is an identical change I made earlier. And what it says is, in this environment, 
Um, this server is going to have 11 resource changes on one node. And if I view the analysis, it says, hey, the port changed between 80 and 8080. So I've been toggling back and forth uh, prepping for this. So before it was 8080, uh, and then we switched to 80. And interestingly, um, it's 11 changes. It's not one. So just because I changed that port in one location, there are many, many places where that has impact. For example, a number of configuration files. The firewall rules needed to be updated to, say, allow the new port through, et cetera. And it only affects this one node, which is something that I'm comfortable with. So when we get to the ServiceNow side and someone needs to assess the risk, they're like, okay, it's 11 changes, one node, that's what we expect, I'll approve it. If suddenly I made a change here that affected my entire production environment, could easily happen if things are targeted differently than I expect, maybe I want to hold off on the approval until I figure out if that's what I really expect. So this impact analysis is still running. While we wait for that, let me just show you one other thing. And never mind, it just completed. So um, that's, that's exactly what happens from the point of view of um, the information that we're going to pass to service now. And this impact analysis will, will show the, uh, the current value of, of 80 and the new value of 8080, as we would expect. I just want to touch on one more thing. Um, the, the ServiceNow change request piece is what's currently running. And that's where we extract this data and create the change request ticket in ServiceNow. And just to kind of see some of the options that are available for you, if we look at what happens in this gate, in this stage, what we're actually doing is really providing uh, just details about how to get to ServiceNow, which stage to promote to when we're actually complete, and what our reporting stage is. And that gives us enough information to be able to pull the data out and create the change request ticket. I also are, I'm also specifying here that I'll allow up to 15 changes per node before that's considered a high risk kind of change. And we'll see that in a moment. So our, our uh, seven steps are complete and we're sitting at this point now. We've done the change request. We're paused waiting for the approval back in ServiceNow. And there's the ticket. So it's a, uh, got our comment, which is really quite uh, useful because I can see just in that one short description what's changing here and make sure this is the correct one. And then some other interesting things. For example, the category is puppet code. The assignment group, which probably matters from a ServiceNow point of view, is change management. And we've assigned a priority and risk level to this based on some logic. This is something that, again, our customers typically want to adjust based on what they consider priorities or risk. Maybe it's the type of server, maybe it's the kind of change. And if we look at um, the risk and impact analysis, we have a link to that impact analysis right here, and then a human readable form of it. So you recall, I showed you that impact analysis output. It says the status is done. There's going to be three things added, five modified, three removed. And it's safe because that's 11, and we're going to allow up to 15. Some other things that are important is the affected CIs. So right now, it's only the one server. You know, this is potentially uh, something that I could have a huge list of CIs that are going to be affected. And that's really what I want to accomplish with... Uh, ensuring that I approve these correctly. So as, a, as an approver, I look at this, I say impact analysis is safe. Uh, it seems to have a reasonable number of changes. I'm gonna go ahead and approve this. And here again, the approval workflow is something that people create in ServiceNow. We just took the default one for this. So it's a two-stage approval. The change manager needs to do initial approval. And then I have a set of, um, approvers that are part of a change review board. And I'll say that, you know, Ron Kettering approves it as part of a cab uh, meeting, for example. But imagine the cab meeting when you look at this and you say, yeah, 
it's safe because it's only these things. It's only affecting one node. Let's go ahead and do it as opposed to guessing. We'll approve that. And we're now living in a different phase of service. Now we're in the scheduled phase. And this is where people will do things like set a plan date, um, an actual date and do whatever uh, pieces in the service now world that make sense for their business process um, to implement our demo, I'm going to actually click implement. So we're going to go ahead and kick the process off. And let's take a look at what's happening. If we look at the work notes now, we'll notice that in live fashion, these notes are going to be populating to say, it's been approved. We're going to go ahead and promote this uh, commit to get to the next stage, which is stage five. And this is the comment that I have uh, updated to port 8080. We're checking if there are any approvals. So if I had defined in service uh, in continuous delivery for puppet enterprise, for example, that I need approvals at these stages, we'll automatically approve it based on the fact that someone approves it in service now. And that's, that's also a very powerful thing because if I control the authorization properly, nobody can come in here and manually do it. It all needs to follow the service now uh, workflow. And we'll notice I have a new, uh, another new event and that should really be the deployment. So I've got two deployments running, one to my production environment, one to my CD for PE production environment. And these things now are actually pushing that code change through the pipeline and into production, just like we wanted to do with these change requests. And eventually, uh, when this is fully completed, we'll see a note that indicates that we're waiting for the second environment to fully deploy. And then we'll see that the, that the, uh, the process here in ServiceNow, the change request, uh, will be closed out. And I'll have a closed code of successful. The closed notes will be the indication to inform CD for PE of what to do. And that's where we knew what stage to move to. And then we also have, um, the out of the box change tasks. So if we look at the change tasks in service now, we'll see two closed change tasks. Again, these are the out of the box workflow. You do whatever makes sense um, from a business point of view. This is the standard workflow that we used for actually uh, going through the, the process for change requests. And that's it, the change is done. We can go ahead and close it and it's complete. So what we've actually done is made that change, had it ripple all the way through all the environments, do the automated testing, get all the automated approval, just to push the uh, port change to my web server. And if I do, this is my sample website, um, as expected, it's no longer listening on port 80, but if I go to port 8080, as I specified, there it is. So that's uh, the second demonstration, the part that handles enriched change requests, as we called it. The third thing we want to look at is automated incident registration. And for this, we want to be able to present incidents to ServiceNow based on behavior that's happening in Puppet. And we want to do that in a completely automated way. So I reduce manual error. I ensure that people are actually doing this because they don't have to do anything to have it happen. So I don't get things dropped because of a manual effort. So why do this? Why should we connect Puppet and ServiceNow for incident registration? Well, one of the things that Puppet does is ensure compliance with a standard configuration. What I've showed you today in Puppet was uh, an expected change. I changed the port, that's an expected change. So Puppet made the change and said, this is intentional. The, uh, the other part of Puppet is potentially catching something that might be more problematic, which is someone manually made a change that they should not have. And for that, Puppet can detect that and actually make uh, a remediation. But what we want is we want that remediation to show up in ServiceNow as an event. 
and those events should be correlated and I should be alerted on those. So for example, if I get a flood of systems that suddenly um, have a, a service going up and down, for example, or user permissions changing from disallowed to allowed back to disallowed, that might indicate something is going on that I probably need to look into outside of a puppet. Like why is this user permission changing? And what we're able to do is we're able to analyze reports coming out of Puppet, look for these corrective changes, and then send them to ServiceNow automatically with all the associated content that uh, will help you figure out what's going on. So now let's look at the what. The what is to pass along relevant details around Puppet runs, including details from the reports, when systems drift out of compliance. And this integration has two modes. I'm going to show one of them, which is what customers have asked us for, and that is to publish events to ServiceNow and then allow some ServiceNow processes and logic to determine the correlation between those events, and if so, either create an incident or an alert based on those things. But of course, we can create incidents directly too, if that makes sense. And let's talk about the how. So the how is the nuts and bolts of what, what's actually occurring. So every Puppet run, there's a report generated. That report can have one of three or four states, four being an error. But let's assume it doesn't error. It can either be nothing's changed, everything's okay, or it could be there was an intentional change, but it's okay, or a corrective change, and that's really not okay. So we look for these things, and then uh, we forward the details to the ServiceNow API when there's a change that is detected or a failure that's detected. And then in ServiceNow, we'll do some logic to handle that. So again, a visual of the flow. We start with Puppet Enterprise running on a scheduled basis or on demand. As soon as that srv1.company.com Puppet run completes, it generates a report which will indicate if something needed to be changed, and we'll pass that information to ServiceNow in the form of an incident or an event that shows what changed and why. So the first thing is you'll notice on the corrective events on Puppet, Within ServiceNow, uh, I don't have any. If I looked at all events, we would see many events. For example, um, these are intentional changes. The one I just made, for example, is the intentional change for that port. Uh, I might have unchanged. I might have a series of things. And you know, we're passing all this information in case people want to do some analysis. You could decide if you want that or not. But the key thing is to be able to say, I'm only interested in the corrective events, so we can filter on that. And of course, the business logic that's doing this is doing the same kind of thing, looking for corrective events and capturing the information. So let's go ahead and trigger a corrective event. And here's the way I'm going to do that. I'm going to run a task, which is a, uh, an automated script that I run either from Puppet Enterprise or from a command line or wherever I want to run it. And this task is just going to operate on a service. And I'm going to stop the Puppet service. So probably something that I want to make sure doesn't happen because we need the Puppet service to handle behaviors for us. But I'm going to externally just force that to stop. The same thing as if I logged it in and said, stop this service. And I'm going to run it on these four nodes. So I have a Linux 0 and 2, and a Windows 0 and 2. You notice very quickly we get some responses back. The Puppet service is now no longer running on those nodes. And let's go ahead and run Puppet now on that same group. So I think it was zero and two, which is my CD for PE production group. So zero and two. 
So four machines, I'm going to click Run Puppet, and let's see what happens. Of course, these are running in parallel. Give them a few seconds. And what we would expect to see is one corrective change on each of the four machines. And that corrective change should be the Puppet service is supposed to be running, and it's not, so we'll restart it. Okay, so all four have reported about 40 seconds for this kind of thing, but I have four corrective changes. And if we look at one of the reports, it says service puppet was stopped and now it's running. That's all fine and good. That's standard puppet behavior, but let's look at the behavior in service now. I have the same four um, events that came in and they carry the same information that the Puppet uh, log would show. And I can, of course, get to it. I can look at the full report from this uh, particular link. And I can see facts or whatever is necessary and some additional information as well. So I got these uh, four events. What we also did is create some business logic that correlates these events. So I have one alert for the four events because they're really all the same problem. There was a service that was stopped as a group. We started it on the service. I would really want to look at this once, not four times. And this is, this is actually, I have a quote from, um, from a, one of our ServiceNow contacts that I'll read to you in a moment because this is a tremendous time savings. A lot of the problems uh, with handling alerts in general are false positives or just noise. Even if they are positives, they're a flood and things get uh, kind of lost in the noise. So if I can consolidate and correlate these things, that would be very beneficial. So it's a corrective change. And I can see here, for example, that there's these four alerts are correlated to it. And I can look at each one of these, but more importantly, I can look at this top one and say, well, why was this particular puppet service changed from stop to running? We know that we fixed it, but why did it happen to begin with? And that's kind of the human process to uh, figure out if someone logged in when they weren't supposed to, for example, or whatever have you. But the real power is the fact that I can do this event correlation. Um, if I choose to, I can open an incident from here or have Puppet automatically open the incidents on our behalf, depending on the workflow that you want to implement. The final piece is the up-to-date asset management. And this has been a, a concern for us and um, for many of our customers, and that is ServiceNow CMDB relies on a discovery process to populate it. That discovery process tends to be um, pretty heavy in terms of resource utilization, and it tends to cause problems in the environments where it's run because it's agentless, so it's pinging machines, it's trying to connect through ports and then do some analysis, etc. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually leverage the data that Puppet knows in its fact and database information and populate that into the CMDB directly? And this is, uh, as I mentioned, the quote, I'll, I'll read it to you in a moment. But what we want to do with this is to be able to feed data from Puppet into ServiceNow. So in the example on the right-hand side, I have a Puppet automation tab at the bottom, and that's all the details that Puppet knows about the system. So ServiceNow may know the asset tag and the person who bought it and the lease termination and when it uh, depreciates and you know all the things about the asset. But for up-to-date details about the system itself, Puppet is much more up-to-date than ServiceNow typically because each time we run, we gather this information. So we can just populate this and then Avoid running the ServiceNow discovery process unless you really need to, for example, to find systems that are rogue 
or that are new in the environment and just let Puppet keep the rest up to date. And now let's talk about the how. So we've gone through a number of different iterations of how this will work. Uh, fundamentally, we can update the CMDB directly. The ServiceNow best practices are not to do that, but rather to have an intermediate step where there's actually a, uh, a synchronization mechanism, in which case we'll populate details to a holding area, and then a, an app in the ServiceNow marketplace will actually process that and populate the CMDB on our behalf. And then here's a quote that's direct from, uh, from this bank configuration management person. Um, ServiceNow Discovery has been the bane of my existence. So basically, people don't run it because it destabilizes sy systems in production. So if you have to do a change request just to run Discovery, it just doesn't happen because why risk that? But what ends up happening is the CMDB gets further and further out of date. So you tend not to be able to trust it for things like, does it have all the patches that it needs to? Does it have updated versions of certain secure libraries and things like that? So since we know that, we can reduce the amount of discovery runs and keep things up to date. And similar fashion, here's kind of the flow that we would see, where periodically we would um, update our own facts from the agent runs on the left-hand side and periodically send that information over to um, ServiceNow, possibly remapping some things. And that's what you can kind of see here, where Puppet stores this information as facts, you know, name value pairs, as well as information in, in the Puppet database. And we'll push that up to this connector app in ServiceNow, which will do some mapping. You know, maybe we call it cert name, but ServiceNow calls it name. We call it BIOS vendor, ServiceNow might call it manufacturer. So we'll do this ETL process and then ultimately populate the CMDB. And just a quick word about where we are with these. So the first three are all published on the Forge already. So they're all Puppet authored. You can go to the Forge right now and actually download and install each of those. That's exactly the process I went through for this demo setup. And the fourth one is still on the roadmap because what we're working on is how to properly, properly get it into that marketplace in a way that is... Um, aligned with releases and ensuring that we have uh, a predictable, maintainable model for that for our customers. And with that, thank you. I think we still have some time for some questions. So let's take a look and see what's out there. So uh, James asks, is there a way to configure ServiceNow integration at a group environment level? And it looks like uh, that's been answered already. So thank you to the moderators for going ahead and answering those things. Um, I can tell you that earlier we had some questions around configuration of these, like how heavy are they to configure? Do I need to be a ServiceNow expert to do it as well as a Puppet expert? And the answer is generally their uh, Puppet subject matter experts can definitely handle creating the integration on the Puppet side. Of course, there's some permissions that are usually required and approvals to get any changes made to ServiceNow, but um, that's kind of the model, fairly lightweight in terms of installing this integration. Earlier, there was also a question around, um, are they dependent on each other? So each of those integrations, as I showed in that, um, in that diagram, they're all completely independent. If you go to the Forge, you'll see three separate integrations that walk through how to install it, how to configure it, and what to do as far as setup. And while we're waiting for, to see if there's another question, let me read you the quote from, uh, you know, un, unsolicited quote from our ServiceNow contact. And that is, uh, 
I'll read it directly. We see lots of customers using multiple monitoring tools to capture events within their ecosystem. When something goes awry within operations, there is a ton of noise in the knock, and they have to battle through it to identify which one is the root cause. If you read Gartner's metrics on the cause of outages, 80% of outages are a result of change. And we know that very well at Puppet. Whether that is a schedule or an approved change or the result of an unapproved accidental change. One of the biggest challenges in the service management world is trying to figure out what's changed within the environment. Change control is a great tool within ServiceNow. And ServiceNow Discovery is an okay tool, their quote, but it typically only gathers environment changes daily or weekly. By pulling in configuration changes from Puppet in near real time, we can identify those changes faster, map them to approved changes, or investigate whether they were unapproved or accidental. It could be a game changer when it comes to preventing outages or reducing overall mean time to recovery. So there's a lot of power with this and leveraging the, the pieces in terms of what they do the best is really what we want to accomplish with this. So um, I'll, I see one in there if, uh, if I get to it before one of the moderators. How frequently did the event management puppet fax to CMDB sync happen? So uh, these are the kind of things that you can tune. For the asset management, that's still the roadmap item. But um, from the way I did the self-service infrastructure, um, each time I update the form in ServiceNow, we're going to... Um, make that change in the puppet facts. And similarly, if I update the puppet facts, um, we'll do a regular sync, I think uh, on some interval, which is configurable right now. So it looks like Dan is answering that as well. And we'll give it another moment for any further questions. If there are questions down the line, um, there's certainly a feedback mechanism to get a hold of us. And the, uh, the those Forge integrations that I'm showing have a very, very rapid um, refresh cycle. So since the time I started prepping for this a few days ago, I've seen uh, releases come through that improve it on a, on a regular ongoing basis. So um, it's definitely an area of a lot of interest and a lot of focus for us. And with that, it looks like we're reached the end of our session. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. And uh, your feedback is welcome, of course, as well.